everybody, it's Margaret. Welcome to my channel. You're on booktube. Happy celebration of Black History Month. It's continuing. I'm still reading Black Classics. I'm going to be doing the Black History Month tag next, so stay tuned for that. Taste Life Twice is my publishing company, so I thought I'd put it in the frame. I finally also am getting my Jane Austen mug in the frame, which contains tea. Janae will be happy to note that we have our little matching mug. Today, I am coming at you with an AuthorTube special. So this is, I think, the third in the Research Rabbit Holes series, and it's going to be on furniture. I know, thrilling! Don't click away! <laughs> this is one of those things you might think, how much does this really matter when you're reading through a historical novel to hear about what type of chair, or how many chairs, or where people put their clothes, or what wood is used for the table. Basically, what I have gone in search of details for is logistical things that concern the setup of the house to make it feel realistic. And I've had lots of fabulous resources for this, so in case any authors are watching, wanted to pass this on. In case my little niche of the 19th century in the UK and the Western Isles might be helpful to you. <laughs> For this one, I've got several resources to explain and then put pictures up. So this is me talking off of my outline, but I'll have to find the pictures and put them up maybe while I'm talking or maybe in between, who knows. Usually where I start is online looking for resources. And I would say the most fun resources that I came across were open air museums because these are the ones I got to see in person. So this is a museum curator's best guess at what a typical household would look like for a certain income level for a certain decade, I'll say, in a certain town or village or region. The Museum of Isla Life on Isla, and I can remember which trips I saw these on. I went to Isla in 2018 with my mom. This museum was a drive out to a peninsula. The attendant was very nice. She let me sneak back and like see the little research library that they have as well. And it's just full of objects that have been preserved from the area. Sometimes even they have to sort of sleuth out what they were used for and and who they belong to and stuff. They have a lot of things recovered from tips, basically stuff people threw out and then historians or archeologists went through the tips like 20 years later going, oh, they threw this stuff that was a century old out in the weather and it's been here under the mud ever since. So, I mean, lucky, lucky us so we found it. I've also got the Dal Dalgarvin Mill and Museum in Ayrshire. This is a mill that's been converted by the last mill owners to a museum and a cafe. And the, the family who run it are delightful. When we happened by, we got a personalized tour of the back end because the man who had converted it is getting on in years and he had written a book or was doing another volume of a book about the mill's history. And he has especially focused on costumes in the region. So for him, it was people in the region finding stuff in their attics that their grannies had put away and they'd never taken out. So again, just like lucky finds from 100 years ago, more than that. One of the funniest, randomest things that they found was uh, people who had been missionaries in China when the Boxer Rebellion happened in 1900. The palace was sacked, artifacts like court robes were taken, and they ended up carrying that back with them to Ayrshire, Scotland. Like, what? That's not what you, that was not, that is not what you think to find when you open a, a old trunk in the attic, right? So there's some crazy interesting finds. I also went to the Summerlee Museum of Scottish Industrial Life in Clydeside. So these are very close together, but they're different counties in 2018. That was more of a um, business setting, so machines, um, conveniences, and I did make a lot of notes about what machines would have been common in the period that I was writing about. They had an outdoor uh, example of a mine shaft, and it wasn't operating 
or they weren't letting people in when I was there for some reason, but I got to see the outside and how it would look, so that was pretty cool. The Achendron Open Air Museum in Argyle. This was fabulous. I went there on my own in 2018. This was the one place in the trip that I had planned to be there on a special day because it was the last, I think, Saturday of the season that they would have um, a walking demonstration. And as I've said before, walking is something that's particularly interesting to me as a folklore relic that people keep alive. And it's singing as you walk cloth, as you, as you felt cloth for uh, weatherproofing. And so this wonderful group of women of a variety of ages uh, came together and taught singing and, you know, what is that called? Took the piss <laughs> many times and I tried to just follow along and they were delightful. So um, in terms of furniture, this was multiple houses set up in a village and they were rescued basically from different uh, time periods. So this bit, village had been abandoned, but like step by step. So they had restored the roof on one, they had restored the, you know, flagstones outside on another, and you got to see sort of the evolution of um, the housing and what people would have had in a button bend or like a two-room cottage back in the day. Yeah, fascinating. So definitely recommend a visit. The Kildonan Museum in South Uist. So this goes back to my 2015 trip on my own when I went to Uist and Barra and did not have a car, so ended up like tramping. This one had examples, an example of a loom, which I ended up copying. So I did a lot of internet searching for looms and how it's supposed to work. I tried to talk to someone in Oregon about it. I watched a lot of tutorials to try to get a sense of what was the movement? What was the repetitive movement to give that to my character? What time of year would you do it? All these sorts of things. And in the Keening, there's a part where they're trying to get the loom out of the house and, you know, could you break it down? Was it portable? Um, these kinds of things. And so my first example of that, I think, um, was in Kildonan. And then the Weaver's Cottage in Kilbarkin when we went to this house that had been around for 400 years, I think, and it had been a weaver's cottage and was restored to that style, even though it had been changed afterwards. So they had uh, restored the garden in the back to the plants that they would have grown for dyes for the wools if they did their own dyeing. They also had the basement rooms converted such that the windows let in the best light, the uh, height for the looms that they used for weaving were allowed to dip down in the underground. It was something something about the height and like having a dugout part of the, the ground was necessary. Yeah, you got to see how they sort of sat in their little cockpit, had everything around and would just work away. They also had very plain uh, examples of chairs. I remember candlesticks and not candlesticks, but... Um, lamp like hand lamps and so that was a big piece of research like what would they have used for light in my place in my time um, and there were several different possibilities at the weavers museum so I sort of looked those up to try to figure out which one I wanted to use so those are all the in real life open air museums that I visited other places I looked for furniture research were the internet would take me to Etsy looking at like specialty items that were historical, looking at Christie's, the auction house, when they would come across usually pretty extravagant, but sometimes like very plain and ordinary, so that would be interesting. Um, and I happened upon the Regional Furniture Society in the UK based on that. So that's the sort of thing where you go from Google to place two, place three, place four, and then you finally get to something where you're like, oh, they have a publication. Their publication is searchable online. And you finally, you finally get to the detail that you need. So yeah, research rabbit hole indeed. What else do I have? Uh, I worry about, as an author, I worry about how to set up the layout of the interiors. This is why I'm doing all this research in the first place, because um, I want it to feel homey and um, true to history. When I am looking for uh, furniture details, I'm looking to get something historically accurate, but also um, 
not inconsistent. So I don't have a book Bible where I write down all these things, but I have done a book the house map, I guess, <laughs> where I'll write kind of like an architect will do for a, a plan and put down like what the dimensions of the rooms are, where the things are, the bed, the desk, the table, this sort of thing, the windows, the kitchen equipment and all that kind of thing so that I, I remember where they're going and that makes some of the blocking easier later down the road. So there we've got open air museums, internet searching, my own imagination comes up with a house map, but I've also got books for some of these. So some of the books I've used for ideas to start with are The Carlisles at Home by Tia Holm, which is a Persephone book. The Carlisles being Thomas Carlyle, who's a famous writer, historian in Victorian era. Furniture and fittings in the traditional Scottish home. So this is one of those regional furniture society um, books that I found in a gift shop at one of those museums, and that is like the gold standard. I love going to the museums and raiding their gift shops because they're the best books, seriously. We've got something else here from the internet. The Book of the Home and Encyclopedia of All Matters Relating to the House and Household Management, Volume 1. So this is one of those like reprints that they do and then sell on Amazon. So it's like what the actual book looks like, but not a very good job of putting it together. But if I'm looking for something desperately, I'll turn to that. Random stuff I find in used bookstores, such as Lighting for Historic Buildings, Roger Moss. This will give you ideas of like... What would the lamp look like? What kind of um, candlestick or hand lamp they would be using, etc. And then a really fun one is the Garden Cottage Diaries. So I've read this in and out, inside and out, many times by Fiona J. Houston or Houston. She lives in Britain and they say Houston for the street, so I don't know. My year in the 18th century, she basically does her own challenge like the TV shows do and uh, lives in a garden shed on her property and lives like it's the 18th century. So with the clothes and the chores and the baths and the no heating. And so she ended up having to think through what would be the most efficient way to set up her house and do her tasks. And um, that was as good a way as any as thinking through what my characters would do. So I really, really appreciated her reasoning in her 20th century mind back to like how this would have um, been worked out and why. So this is a great, great book. And then we come to basically what I'm working on now, which is problem areas. So for the, the book I'm working on now, um, I've got a couple settings that I'm not sure how to arrange the furniture because I don't know what was technologically available. So this is one of the things I'm working on this month is covering up research gaps. So for food preservation, especially because I don't want to get that wrong. Um, I've got a character in a top floor tenement in New York City and I want to know how she keeps foods cold in 1894. So when you have perishable foods like milk, like where would you put it in the summer? Do they have any sort of um, chilling thing without being in the basement and having like a food cellar? And then the other setting is a ramshackle farmhouse turned into flats outside of Chicago in 1893. So these two settings, I need to know how they would guard their perishable food from spoilage, whether that's a piece of furniture or whether it's something outside or whether it's an ice delivery at that time. So it's on my list. And then finally, I wanted to add a recent interesting tidbit that I heard about from Jennifer Howard in her book Clutter a History, which is a really good book. So she was talking about the secondary and tertiary markets for all manner of goods that happened in the Victorian era and how we don't have that anymore. We have it for big business and industry, uh, but we do not have it for personal households. She gave a quote from uh, our mutual friend, which she said I think was her famous Dickens novel for all the random crap that could be sold, which is funny. So if you've read Our Mutual Friend, chime in if you know the scene she's talking about. It recalled to me when I lived in Istanbul and I would hear someone coming around going, 
Boudin, boudin. And it, it meant like, here you go, here you are. At first I wondered, what is he saying? What does that mean? Why is he going around with a hand cart with all this junk on it? Because it would be electronics or it would be like small furniture. And I was like, what is he doing? He was going around collecting stuff and paying for it because he knew where to sell it in another market. So it was just very smart. It's a system that was working for a big city like Istanbul. And yeah, the Victorians did it for, for everything from coal dust to leftover food to old fabric scraps, and etc. So in one way, they were very thrifty in terms of reusing materials. But in another, when you look up... Um, this website, I forget the name, I just looked it up from the bibliography that Jennifer Howard provided, which is amazing. There's a website that is people going around snooping into Victorian buried garbage dumps <laughs> and looking at the material culture, and it's fascinating, but they did make a lot of junk and then throw it away in a non-responsible way. So, I mean, they're all over the place, right? Victorians, what are you going to do with them? Can't live with them. Can't live without him. <laughs> anyway, this has been my author tube video for this month. Getting furniture right, getting the home setting, making readers feel like they're really back in time based on real life open air museums that other people put a lot of thought into, based on books that I've read that I've gotten from gift shops, based on websites that have done a lot of research into the subject, and you know, I'm still puzzling through the latest the latest problem. If anyone has any resources they want to pass on, comment down below. I'd love and appreciate you for always. All right. Thanks so much, and I'll see you again next time.